I think what we now face as our biggest challenge is actually um, our passion uh, and the balance between passion and profession. It's a constant, constant, constant balance. Business of Architecture UK, episode 51. Hello and welcome, Ryan Willard here from the Business of Architecture UK. And this week we are going to give you a treat and you're going to get to hear the panel discussion that happened a few weeks ago uh, at you and I office at the last BOA UK live event. And that event was focused on the seven threats to an architecture business. And in this podcast, we have our guest panel, which comprised of David West from eGray West. He is an urban planner. He's one of the founding partners of eGray West. They've grown their practice to around 50 to 70 people, I think it is. They've been going for 15 years. He is a tour de force, very passionate um, designer who's seen it all. Um, he was on the panel. We had Hazel Rounding of Shed KM and Hazel, she's been involved in KED from the very earliest days of its inception, um, a little bit after when it came out of Urban Splash um, and when it was based up in Liverpool and she spearheaded the new office that's happened in London and again she's seen, she's sculpted, she's crafted this business and she's seen it go through all these different uh, stages of its evolution. Um, we have Johan Taft, the Navy SEALs of business mentors who's worked with many, many different companies, taking them from being good to consistently good and he knows intimately how businesses have to deal with these seven threats and how they can na best navigate them. Um, I also on the panel we had Tara Boladay of Boladay Studio, she's the Reba J um, 2018 rising star and she is a real entrepreneur, she's already at this very early stage in their career, she's created other unique ways of diversification for income, um, they've created the My part three app. She systematized much of her design process. Um, and again, she really, really understands business. And we had Tim Burgess, who is a passionate entrepreneurial mind. He has walked the path of solo practitioner to teaming up with a partner to growing a practice. So there are around 10 people now. Um, and he's been doing that for over a decade. And he's, again, he's got a real good hands-on experience of what it takes to grow a business. So we have this formidable panel and they were all discussing how they avoid, they navigate the seven threats and also how these seven threats actually change their form, how these things um, evolve as practices evolve. And the conversation w got really, really interesting, um, particularly when it came to talking about how to protect yourself as a practice, what's the one thing that architects can do to uh, weather rough economic climates, that's in there, and also the nature of people and how important it is to cultivate uh, a company culture. And for architecture businesses, this is one of the most important things that we can ever invest in and I think every single panelist agreed with that and it really came out um, wonderfully so sit back and relax and if you're on your bicycle enjoy your cycling across the canals and listen to the seven threats to an architecture business so when the event up live on Eventbrite you're kind of like wondering, is anybody going to come? What's going to happen? How are people going to find out about it? And every day for like the last few months, I'm kind of like addicted to my emails. So every time I see a message come up and I see Romina's here or Keith's bought a ticket, I'm like, yes, so amazing. So thank you so much for coming. I really, you know, it's a, it's a Tuesday evening and it means the world that you're all here. And, you know, I hope it's a fantastic, fantastic evening. So. The evening, a little bit about how the evening is going to go. Um, we're going to have, I'm going to run through the seven threats to an architecture business, introduce those and introduce the theme of the evening. And then we're going to have a panel discussion where our industry experts, these are architects and uh, business consultants who have um, 
got, got between them hundreds of years worth of experience working, growing practices and working with businesses, helping them avoid and navigate through these common seven threats. Uh, and there will be an opportunity for you guys as well to ask your questions to them as well. And at the end, there's going to be some networking and we've got some really nice canapes. So we've saved the best bit to last. And at the very end of the evening as well, there's also going to be an opportunity for you to participate in some further BOA trainings and other contents that we've got available for you. So what I want you to do quickly is everybody's come here for a reason. Everyone, I assume, is, is an architect. Let's show of hands. How many architects do we have in the room? And how many practice, who's, who's owning their own practice? And planners, engineers, and other building professionals? Brilliant. So it's a, real, it's, a, it's a real mix. So what I want you to do is just with the person next to you, is just take a few minutes and tell them why it is that you've come, what it was that you wanted to find out this evening, what brought you here. So just take a few seconds to do that. Brilliant, good. Now, now, we're all, now we're all acquainted and we're all getting to know each other a little bit better. So the evening is about the seven threats to an architecture practice and a little, a little background to how this, how this has come about. So I'm an architect like many of you. I run my own architecture practice and in 2014 I left um, some pretty, pretty great job. I was contracting for most of my career. I graduated in the recession and was a kind of disgruntled, frustrated architect that was always complaining about my, my pay and just, just felt really frustrated, particularly after, after part three. Um, and I, a contract ended, it didn't get renewed, and I ended up, as in my wisdom, thought that the solution to all my uh, problems would be to start my own architecture practice. And I did that, and then I really learned what it was to not get paid very well. <laughs> and those first few years actually were very humbling to kind of go through that experience of really not earning very much money, having to deal with it, the, the emotional ups and downs with it, the stress, the stress that it caused on my family when I had to, you know, beg and borrow money from them and, you know, and, and pay them back and the stress it caused on them. It was, it was quite an emotional journey. And... I really knew that there was something deeply missing in my education or there was something that there was something that I could I could figure out and it kind of dawned on me that what that was was my business education um, and my sort of approach and actually just identifying as an entrepreneur or identifying as a business person that was something I was really really denying and I started reading books. I started getting interested in business education. I started devouring absolutely everything and kind of got really obsessed with it. And my heroes began to shift from people like Mies van der Rohe to becoming really interested in people like Elon Musk and, and Jeff Bezos and these other types of characters who perhaps I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been interested in. And also money really getting, you know, what is it? Well, I, I kind of just accepted. I'd accepted for a long time that architects don't get paid a lot of money. And it was actually causing me a lot of, a lot of pain. And I, wanted, I knew that I was responsible for how much I was earning. And I wanted to take total control of that. So I ended up, uh, as I said, doing a lot of personal development work. I ended up hiring a business mentor, which was probably the best investment I've ever made in my life. Um, really kind of transformed my way of thinking about business, entrepreneurship, and it also opened me up to a whole world of other people who were running different types of businesses and learning about, about how they were doing business, how they were networking, how they were scaling uh, their own companies, how they were taking things to market, how they were marketing, how they were selling. And I kind of became seduced and fell in love with it. And one of the podcasts that I was listening to a lot was in the US called The Business of Architecture. And I really, really wanted to hear uh, a UK voice. I really wanted to hear some British architects. I, I, was, I didn't want to hear any more Californian intonation. I really wanted the estuary vowels of a South Londoner. And I went out and I, I, I contacted Enoch, who's now my, my business partner, uh, and I said to him, if I start interviewing some architects in the UK, can I put them on your platform? And he was like, yeah, go for it. 
So that was about three years ago. And I ended up getting really into it and really kind of obsessed. And it began purely for me to find out about my own business and for me as a way for me to network. And I ended up giving Enoch basically too many podcasts that he could handle. And about a year and a bit ago, we launched the Business of Architecture UK, which has been completely um, for the UK market and for talking about the nuances that we are dealing with on a daily basis as practicing architects. And it, in the process, I've interviewed, I counted this morning, it's over 70 architects in the last few years. Um, and there's been, in those conversations, and I've, I've spoken to all sorts of brilliant minds and industry leaders, marketeers, business coaches, salespeople, um, architects who have grown their practices very rapidly, architects who have been sole practitioners for 10 years or so. And in these conversations, there was these reoccurring themes that kept coming up again and again and again. And over the Christmas period, I decided to have a little bit of reflection, re-listen to a lot of these interviews, and try and distill what these themes actually were. What, what, what were they coming from? And I, I came up with the seven, the seven threats. And I kind of had a, a larger pile of them at first, and I kind of shared them with some other architects and shared them with some other uh, business consultants and entrepreneurs and kind of whittled them down to what we've got this evening. So, before I go into the seven threats, I think it's, it's useful to know what are the, some of the symptoms of the seven threats. And I've personally probably made the mistake of going through all of the seven threats. I've had all sorts of amazing, wonderful, terrible stories with losing clients and doing silly things and all the stuff that happens in business. Um, and it's the more people I speak to as well, it becomes more of a, that's, that's part of business, the ups and downs, and that we learn through making mistakes and we learn to fail forward. And some of the symptoms of the seven threats, if, you know, one of the seven threats might be affecting your business, might be you might find yourself working with the wrong kind of clients, or you're experiencing kind of inconsistent growth in your business, or maybe you're just doing unfulfilling work. I know that that's often, can, you know, we set out to do a dream architecture practice and then we end up finding ourselves doing projects that are not really lighting us up on the inside. So very quickly, again, I wanted to quickly share with each other, just share what is the biggest obstacle that you've dealt with in your businesses or career and with the person next to you. Just keep it really, really short and just, just, just so you can get a flavor of what it is that people are doing in the room. So go for it. Brilliant, okay, thank you very much. Excellent, give yourself a big round of applause for that, because that's it. Okay, excellent, so on to the seven threats. The seven, there's an amazing sign up there, I don't know if you've anyone seen it, it's just, they've written it in the, on the writing up there, and it says the seven deadly threats to an architecture practice. And it's up there for all the developers to see, I like it, it's, uh, it's really, it's, it's good. Um, so, the first one is poor cash, cash flow. So I'm gonna go through these pretty rapidly. I'm not gonna to spend too long on each of them. I did, I don't know if anyone listened to the podcast that I, let, I released yesterday. Um, I probably goes, I probably spend nearly close to an hour going through all of these things. So if you want some more depth in that, from my perspective, listen to, listen to that. <clears throat> so the first one is poor cash flow. So cash flow is money in and out of your business. And you may be familiar with the dictum, turnover is vanity, profit is sanity, and cash flow is reality. And in architecture, we have long sales cycles. It can take a long time from meeting a client to actually getting them to sign a contract, to actually start work with them. And then the projects themselves, you know, a short project might be two years. A long project might be 20 years long. So obviously, you know, you can't bill at the end of 20 years because that's madness. You'd end up going totally bust. But that, that on a on a sort of more localized scale, we as architects do need to be very aware of how, ca how cash flow is operating and how we structure our billing. And also with, um, you know, many small businesses find themselves in problems because they have got invoices which are unpaid or a client is refusing, refusing to pay. Now that can be 
you know, that can be a very, very stressful situation. And also there are, you know, ways of mitigating for that. And it begins with the, the, the initial robust conversations that happen up front. Um, I remember one of the podcasts I was talking with, um, with Johan, actually, and he was saying often the first thing he does when he goes into a business is look at the profit and loss statements and the balance sheets of a company. And it can be quite shocking, actually, how many unpaid invoices are latent in a business. And architects, particularly, we're often, we, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to disrupt the relationship. We don't want to upset anybody to go and chase chase for these things. But cash flow, when that happens, it can, it can bankrupt a business. It can be very, very serious. It's like blood in a body. Your, your, your business will not last very long at all if there's literally no cash inside of it. So that's the first one. And, on, on, and cash flow is also always a result of your sales and your pipeline activity. So a lot of these, we're always going to keep coming back to sales and marketing, sales and marketing, sales and marketing. That's kind of become, so I want the mantra to be sales and marketing, sales and marketing, sales and marketing, because that is, that is the engine of any business. So number two, lack of resource. So I've broken this down into, into three. So money and capital, time and staff. And here I will just touch upon money and capital, because when you've got money and capital, things can happen as well. You can kind of, you can buy time, you can buy staff, you can employ people, you can build teams. But most businesses fail purely because a lack of resource and a lack of capital to begin with. And I've spoken with many architects who, even really diligent architects who have perhaps saved 20, 30,000 pounds for a number of years, they've got it, they used it in their, in, their, in their business, and it's still not been enough, particularly to mitigate against any kind of mistakes. Um, I mean, I know I've, I've lost, uh, you know, a few thousand pounds before because I've invested it in some kind of advertising or some sort of marketing effort that didn't work. And not that I didn't get that service, it just wasn't appropriate for me. And it wasn't, I wasn't aware of what I was doing. But those, in business, those mistakes can happen and we need to be able to have the financial resources to be able to, to buffer it. And when we've got a lack of, uh, lack of resource, a lack of money and capital, again, the things that quickly suffer are our sales and our marketing efforts. So number three, no market need. So let's just put our hands up again. Who's an architect in here? Yes, there's no shortage of architects, right? There is a lot of architects in the UK. There's a lot of architects in the country. Um, Not only that, is that we are also in competition with other building professionals and other services that provide very similar things, other similar services. And from a client's perspective, it's very difficult to distinguish between an architect, an architectural designer, um, even someone who's doing planning services, or it, it can be very, very murky. And as architects, and again, I use myself as an example when I first started up my own, my own business, my business was about me. My business was about me wanting to extend on my kind of diploma thesis and do those kinds of projects but out in the world. And I did a diploma, my thesis was about hypnotic, how to facil- how architecture can facilitate hypnotic states of mind and higher states of consciousness. So when I, when I, when I took that to market, guess what? <laughs> There wasn't that many people around trying, who were looking for hypnospaces, unfortunately. <laughs> that, that said, I, I did actually, well, one of my first projects was with, a, was, a, was with a Buddhist monastery, so that is, fairly, that, is fairly, that is fairly similar. However, with that as an example, why they ended up hiring me was because of experience to do with listed buildings, not because I had this architectural agenda. And often it's very easy for us to communicate our own personal agendas and there's just nobody cares. And I think that was my biggest aha moment was when I was putting out all this stuff that nobody cared. And actually it set me free a lot because it actually meant that the way that I could distinguish myself was to start listening for a market need. What, what problems can I actually solve? What do my clients actually want? What are they dealing with? What are their you know, troubles? What are the emotional drivers behind their projects? And when I started doing that, 
that made a big, big difference in my marketing efforts and also being able to distinguish myself from, from my other contemporaries and other practices. Um, number four, discounting to win work. So when we discount, the conversation automatically goes to price. And again, we're kind of, we end up in that back and forth, we end up being compared against other people. When we're discounting our price, it kind of, it, we lose, it's like we, we don't believe in what we're doing. It's not, you know, we kind of lacks a confidence. Uh, and when you've discounted a project just to win something, you can often find yourself delivering a project for way under the fees that you need for it. And in architecture, that can be a relationship. And if you don't renegotiate on the terms, um, that can be a relationship that can last for a long period of time and it will have impact on your other businesses. And it's not easy, it's not easy not to discount. I've been in a situation myself, um, even, and my business mentor was sitting in the front row, so uh, there, there was a time when I ended up being, I was actually trained in a conversation to not, I knew it was, I knew this person was gonna ask me for a discount and I didn't want to give it to them. And I sat down with my business mentor and we had to rehearse the conversation and we rehearsed the context and I knew what I was gonna do, I knew what I was gonna say. And in the midst of the conversation, emotions took over. And all of that went out of the window and it became an emotional, like wanting to please, not wanting to upset, really wanting to do the project. And I gave away a huge amount of fees on that. Whilst on the surface seemed like it was okay, it actually caused a lot of problems in that project um, over the lifetime of having to deliver, of delivering it because it wasn't, I wasn't getting paid properly for it. And I had to find other ways to try and renegotiate those fees or renegotiate something so that I you know, felt like I was getting something. And the emotional game as well is, is one of the big things here in all of these, because when you've discounted or you're not getting paid properly or you've got yourself into that kind of situation, if you're not on top of your uh, emotional intelligence and your own internal conversations, you, things like anger and resentment can quickly build up and that's only gonna deteriorate the relationship. It's only gonna make the project even harder to deliver. So that leads nicely on to number five, lack of leadership. Um, and again, I've broken this down into two. So we've got lack of leadership, we've got leadership of others and self-leadership. And I'll focus on self-leadership because that, for me, is probably the most important aspect of running a business, is your ability to lead yourself into doing things, your ability to be the steward and the total governor, as it were, of your internal domain. That is self-leadership. If you do not have that, you are not able to lead or communicate to other people. Um, we talk about time management, for example. Time, that's not to get overly philosophical, but time doesn't really exist. There isn't anything there physically for us to manage. What there is there for us to manage is ourselves, and to manage ourselves in the sense that we are able to take action and do the things that are necessary and important at the right time when they're effective, even when we don't want to. And you'll see this again and again and again. The conversations I've had with high-performing architects, people who are incredibly successful, they have developed this muscle of self-awareness and emotional intelligence and self-leadership where they can take the action and they can, they can do that even when they don't want to. And there's a big difference between being a boss and being a leader. So being a boss is more where we, it's, it's much more of a, a typical way of human negotiation, where we're trying to convince somebody to do something for us, we're trying to manipulate, we're trying to flatter, we're trying to, you know, all those sorts of things to try and get somebody to do something. That's boss, being a boss. We've all had bosses like that, we all know when it's happening, we've all done it to other people in that kind of uh, in negotiation, but being a leader is, is quite different. Being a leader is much more about seeing the leadership in other people. And that's, a, and that's partly because you've seen it in yourself, and it's partly, um, you know, when, you, when you're able to do that, it gives people the autonomy and the responsibility to really take ownership of lots of, of, lots of different things. A good example of that, um, I had the good fortune to work with Richard Rogers in my, in my career. 
And he was one of these leaders who he did not discriminate between if you were a part one or you were an architect. And he was able to communicate with you as if you were a leader. There was something about, you know, it was obviously a bit of sort of hero worship as well, but when he said something to you, or like, you know, you go and do this, it was very, very empowering. And he had a very kind of, um, uh, a very strong leadership style, the way that he was able to facilitate his business. So number six, fear of selling. So we all hate selling. And when we, when we think of sales, we think of, Bellboy type characters and dodgy car salespeople and you know those irritating. Does anyone get those irritating phone calls that just phone you up and it's somebody they ask you what accident you've been in? Does anyone actually talk, talk to those people? I always talk to them. I always I always see what their sales pattern is and see and see and see what they've got going on. And generally, it's terrible. It's just a blatant pitch. They will just talk at you. There is no communication, and it's awful. Like it's just horrible. And you know the person on the other end of the phone is cringing and wanting to die a little bit as well. <laughs> and it's really it's really really unfortunate. And that is what we think of when we think of sales. And that's how society has trained us to think of sales. Sales, per, sales people are everywhere. Our culture is overly um, consumerist and that we're being sold at every moment of the day, all the, everywhere, adverts, adverts, adverts. And we've kind of got our defenses up against sales. So being associated with sales brings up an aversion. But it's a problem, and it's a massive problem in, in business. Because if you don't like selling, then your business is going to die. It's pure and simple. And there's a lot of different psychology around the fear of selling and the fear of rejection, the fear of being pushy, the fear of being perceived as a salesperson, um, the, the fear that your product or your service won't actually deliver. All these things can be playing in our, in our minds. But when you meet a professional salesperson, and I, I've had the real good fortune of meeting some of the most extraordinary salespeople, they are some of the best human communicators you will ever, ever come across. And I really want to put the message that professional selling is listening. And it's listening to people like they've never been listened to before. And it is so deep, because when you get into that in conversation and you're able to listen to people, your marketing becomes a lot easier, it's more enjoyable, and also you notice that in every kind of human interaction there is some form of negotiation. Every form of interaction there is, you are, being, you are either selling or you are being sold. Um, and as, you know, being masterful and really taking that on as an art, an art of communication, is a very, very fulfilling thing and makes our businesses uh, much, much more profitable and much more interesting and much richer. So, and the final one is losing talent. So there's, a, there's perhaps a trend at the moment where we perceive millennial culture or, or people as being more flighty and people don't stick around in businesses for as long as they once did. Um, but I've come across a, a number of businesses who have had employees who have been there for 25 years plus. And it, there's something that they're doing really, really, really right. And if you're able to cultivate that kind of organization where people stick around for large chunks of their lives and want to do it, that is super, super powerful. Um, and I, I've just brainstormed some ideas of the types of things that what these companies are doing. Julia Barfield was one that really kind of touched me when I was when I'm there in her office and there were so many of her staff that had been around for a long time. And they're very good at communicating their company vision to everybody else. So everybody else is really enrolled in that vision of what the company is doing and where they're going. They are very good at understanding the personal vision of their employees. And that's something that can easily be overlooked, is understanding what are the personal visions and missions of the people that we're working with. Because when you're able to speak into that, that becomes very, very, again, fulfilling, and also it breeds a lot of loyalty and people can see a future. Um, being Acknowledging your staff. Again, it sounds really, really obvious, but actually acknowledgement of your staff or people can really help retain them from leaving. Also having clear 
part, uh, career development, so they can see a future, they can see uh, roles to grow into, that they're being challenged, and of course being fairly remunerated and paid well. And another thing I think as well, some of the, uh, some of the best, you know, the most famous practices in the UK, um, again, RSHP or Fosters or these, these kind of the, the, the archetypal practices of, of, of modern Britain, these architecture practices, not only have they been very good at doing that, but they've also been very good at creating new businesses where people have left and they've become other forces in the architectural industry themselves. And I think that's really, really interesting to look at and to, and to see that kind of uh, leadership and how that's been operating. So that is the seven threats. Take a picture of it. I want us to kind of really think about these as much as possible, because they've been on my mind for a, for a while, and I think, they are, I think they're really, really important. So what I want to do now is I'm going to introduce our guest panel, and we're going to hear from the masters, the experts, um, about how they have navigated around the seven threats, how they've encountered them in their own businesses, um, and how they have structures and systems and stories to tell about when they've been at the peril of some of these threats. So without further ado, would you please welcome David West, who is from the uh, founding director of Studio E. Gray West. Thank you very much, David. We've got Hazel Rounding. We've got Tara Bode of Bode Studio. Hazel Rounding of Shed. Tim Burgess of Co. Burgess. And we have Johan Taft of Magnify Your Greatness. Big round of applause. Thank you very much, guys. So we're going to kick off here with the first question. <laughs> so which of the seven threats have you avoided in your business and how? So I'm going to leave it open and anyone can jump in. I don't think <clears throat> I've avoided any of them. I think I've sort of smashed into all of them at one time or another and probably learned the hard way uh, when the pain really bit. Mm. So there was nothing, you know, super clever about, uh, you know, some seeing it coming and dodging it. I think it was <clears throat> a hard one experience. And was there any one, any one particular that's been, that you've dealt with recently or? Well, oh, um, cash flow is a, as a small business is always the top of the agenda. I was having a quick chat with um, David before we started, and he was saying, you know, for him, that's no longer the primary issue. Once you get to a certain scale and you're at a certain um, size, those things become less important and other things do. But for us still, cash flow is, is, is critical because uh, as in a small business, it's very easy for that to go adrift. And it doesn't, take, it doesn't take much for a couple of people to stop paying you to suddenly feel it bite. Um, and we've been there you know, once or twice in the last few years. Brilliant. Um, we've been going for 20, 21 years now. And I was uh, talking earlier that in many ways, we're a practice that's been going for 21, 22 years. But we're, we've been two businesses. So the first 10 years, um, was a, there were some founding directors <clears throat> and uh, founding shareholders. And uh, within the first six to nine months, a few more of us came on board and took the practice forward. But because of the balance, there was the founders that ran the practice and ourselves that came on board to help do the work and, and churn out the output as much as anything. Um, and then, and we equalized actually back in 2008. Um, and overnight, um, well, three months later, there was the crash. And so we actually, the, the three of us that came on board a little bit later on, inherited a business that had one client, 25 staff, 250 grand's worth of unpaid bills, um, and you know a profile which was a sort of two million turnover practice. And so in many respects, 10 years in, we hit everything and we hit the buffers, and we had to deal with everything overnight. And the one thing we, well, two things we didn't have was a lack of resource. We had too much resource. And um, we had, certainly had a lack of leadership. Um, uh, and we had too much talent, actually. We had too much talent and too much resource. And so in many respects, the practice that I now run, we 
started 10, 12 years ago with all of those issues on a pretty grand scale and in the middle of a recession. And so we had to deal with the issues before we built the business. We had to deal with redundancies. We had to deal with getting the cash, um, payment plans from our one client that existed at the time. And um, in some ways, it's kind of made us the practice we are now because I would say for the last 10 to 12 years, we have obviously dealt with things that are on the list, but in a fairly managed fashion because we've learned to monitor everything on a continual basis. And it's all about balance. Brilliant, thank you. Tara. Um, I'd probably add to that that for us, because we're a relatively new practice, but having come from larger practice where um, I had to deal with cash flow, I had to deal with team, I had to deal with um, business development and bringing, and bringing cash into the practice, I think it's still very fresh in my mind of um, why for us cash flow was critical. And that's how our business has been built in terms of having a diverse approach to, uh, to the way we think about business. And that's why our practice is called the design studio. So we focus not just on architecture, which is our background and what we're passionate about, um, but also product and uh, development. And so the basis of our practice was so we don't get into as many issues in cash flow as I've had throughout my experience having worked with uh, larger practices, smaller practices, um, and, being, and trying to be quite sensible in the way we grow and the way we approach, um, the way we approach um, practice, really. And I think it moves for us into uh, the concept, actually, of lack of uh, leadership. I think it's critical, obviously, and particularly self-leadership, particularly when you're um, being entrepreneurial or entrepreneurial in the way we approach it, because I feel like that is the, um, that's the foundation for everything else. Brilliant. Well, I teach this stuff, so I don't really have the luxury of not getting it right. <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, uh, in the early days when I came out of large corporate and set up my own business, I faced all of these, and it was daunting. Um, the day before, I could pick up the phone and command a quarter of a million pound budget, 40 people, whatever. I had massive resources. The next day, no one on the end of the phone, just me in my little home office. And so I had to go through all of these one by one. Uh, luckily, I came from an industry that was very strong on all of them, and I was very well trained and, um, and worked with all of these right from the early days, from 16 onwards. I, I, I dealt with all of these on someone else's, someone else's business. So it's a bit like going to paid, paid to learn. So it didn't take me too long to get these strong um, when I needed them, when I set up my own business 22 years ago now. Interestingly, I had a call in December from my very first client, and he wants some more help. So I'm meeting up with him next week. Uh, so he obviously thought that I got some of them right. Um, I, I encounter all of these with every single client I work with in different mixes. Um, some of them actually, uh, like you were saying earlier on, too much resource. So resource improperly utilized. So people um, not being challenged, not being tested. And you know, they might have been there 10, 12, 15 years and their lives are um, stale. So sometimes the problems can be the other way. Uh, so over over resourced and underperforming, um, and you see large organisations. I mean, my, my first job was in the navy, and they were certainly over resourced and often underperforming. And so you'd see people in high positions, bored, no motivation, didn't know why they were there, and that's as big a problem I think as being under resourced. When you're under resourced, most people I've met who are under resourced have a lot of fire in their belly or they go, they go out of the business and go and get the job somewhere. But those who stay have got fire in their belly and they find a way. Ryan's a good example. Um, and I remember kicking his backside very, very hard. <laughs> That's an event he talked about earlier on. <laughs> Where the emotions got in the way and when we're under pressure, the emotions do get in the way. And so keeping a calm head, I, I tell a lot of my clients not to slow down because the pace of business is fast nowadays, but to calm down so we can make better decisions from a calm perspective. So um, the big one I encounter a lot in architecture is discounting to win work. Talk about, a bit more about that later on. <laughs> David. Did you say the one we haven't? 
The ones that you have. We have yeah. faced or haven't faced. Have faced. Have faced. Yeah. We definitely used to face and probably might still face at some point cash flow. Uh, I remember saying cash flow is king, cash flow is king, cash flow is king, cash flow is king, cash flow is king for at least the first five years of our <laughs> practice. <laughs> so we've definitely faced it. Uh, and it's not that we won't face it again. I think uh, we, we've definitely faced most of these challenges. I think the one that we probably haven't faced that much yet it is losing talent. I, I, I sort of don't like to see it as losing. Um, in, in a way, I, my, our practice is 15 years old this year. We're, about, we're approaching 70 people in the studio, which is the biggest we've ever been. And we've probably seen five, maybe six practices come out of our practice in 15 years. And I've gained a huge amount of uh, joy, actually, uh, from seeing uh, those practices um, pop out and grow and continue to grow. Um, so the sense of loss, I don't think, is something we particularly feel. I think it's more of a we've enjoyed that talent within our, our umbrella of our studio and the culture within our studio. If there's a reason which we can solve for the, the reason why that person might have decided to leave, if it's a negative reason, then we definitely seek to solve it. But I think, frankly, to date, it's mainly been a really positive reason, whether it be a lifestyle choice, uh, a locational choice, or actually a, sh a simple, straightforward drive to create their own practice, which I then just try and give as much as I can give to that, to that person. Uh, I guess the one we've felt a lot is as cash flow very, very early on, a lot. <laughs> Um, obviously, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, all the time, all the time, definitely. Um, I think what we now face as our biggest challenge is actually um, our passion uh, and the balance between passion and profession. It's a constant, constant, constant balance. You know, uh, I was uncomfortable with the way you promoted this event on LinkedIn because it was dangerously close to someone uh, calling me up on cold selling, just like you did on stage. You won me over a bit more while you were doing your pitch than your LinkedIn pitch. Um, but I'm sort of aware that um, uh, it constantly we're balancing this, why are we doing this for uh, kind, of, kind of passion, um, uh, uh, which does make a lot of architects feel like they are different to a, 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 a another type of profession. And that is a constant and very emotive uh, thing for a creative person to to deal with and uh, and I think our practice definitely deals with that how do we continue to evolve how do we stay fresh how do we enter into new markets how do we do that without falling into for discounting to win work and th that's uh, a huge thing we, we deal with all the time mm. so that is a wrap thank you for listening the views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.